Good afternoon. Hey, Rob. My name is Chris Mowern. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Acton Lecture Series. In addition to those of you who are able to join us here in Grand Rapids at the Acton headquarters, we are joined uh, around the world, I'm pleased to say, through Acton live streaming. So welcome to all of you who are joining us uh, in that way today. Our topic goes to the heart of the mission of the Acton Institute, which is the rapprochement between religion and liberty. Now, when Father Sirico and I began Acton Institute nearly 30 years ago, a considerable challenge for us was the integration at the time uh, between Marxism and Christianity. Certainly in the Catholic world in Latin America, that took the form of liberation theology. Uh, and it wasn't only becoming a dominant force in Catholic institutions, but, but also taking root in many Protestant faculties of theology as well. Now, Father and I knew we had a long and difficult intellectual battle ahead of us to bring about a challenge to this position that was holding sway between Christianity uh, and Marxism. Some progress, I think, has been made. Often we think two steps ahead and one step back. But to take on the challenge of a rapprochement between Islam and freedom takes considerably more courage. But it is a necessary and important intellectual effort and then one that we fully support here at Acton. And for more than a decade, our speaker, Mustafa Akio, has been actively and courageously leading this effort in a popular manner. As a professional journalist and public intellectual, he's been writing books, giving lectures, and writing articles and publicly speaking around the globe, and speaking from a deep knowledge of both the history of the Muslim faith, uh, but also a knowledge of it theologically. And he's not at all naive about the challenge. Indeed, he's been in jail uh, and also had his books banned in Muslim countries uh, for speaking about things such as religious tolerance and religious freedom. But as one committed to both faith, freedom, reason, and religious toleration, he's compelled to continue to speak out about these themes uh, for the Muslim world to hear and for Christians to understand and better appreciate and to ultimately support. And we're pleased to welcome Mustafa here to learn more about his good efforts, to understand better his case for the freedom, uh, for the case for freedom within Islam, and to support his mission uh, within Islam. So please join me in welcoming a longtime friend of our work, uh, personal friend and collaborator in this rapprochement between religion and liberty, Mustafa Aikal. Good afternoon and thank you. Uh, thanks to Acton Institute for hosting me here again. I mean, it's, it's been a decade that I come here every June and attend Acton University, which is really a great pleasure and honor for me to do. And now I'm happy that we can discuss today with all of you today. And thanks for joining us uh, this afternoon. Um, I mean, Chris said that I was jailed. Well, there are people who go through more terrible things than what I went through, so I should say that. I was jailed just for one night in Malaysia. This was two years ago. And the reason was that I gave a lecture in, in which I defended religious freedom, and I ended the lecture with the emphasis that religion cannot be policed. Uh, then five men walked in and they said, we are the religion police. <laughs> so I had to spend that night with those gentlemen and you know, in, in a religion police uh, cell, uh, but, but luckily with some diplomacy, I was let go. But you know, people go through more terrible things than what I've uh, gone through in, in other countries and around the world. So there are people in the Muslim world who are trying to fight for these good ideas of freedom and dignity and equality. We should, add, I honor all of them. Uh, but thank you, Chris, for reminding us that as well. Now, I wanna begin actually by uh, honoring the victims of 
uh, more than 350 innocent souls who were killed in Sri Lanka uh, last week, uh, unfortunately by terrorists acting in the name of my religion. I'm sad to see that. Uh, they were, most of them were Christians worshiping in uh, churches on Easter. I share the pain of their uh, families and their beloved ones. Uh, and uh, I, I should admit that there are people who are acting in the name of Islam and who are doing these terrible things in the world today. Uh, I just should say that they are really, really marginal in the broader Muslim world. Uh, they are, that there's a reason why they're called extremists, they're really extreme, and they, that's why they sometimes attack fellow Muslims as well. They bomb mosques and uh, they target Muslim communities they don't agree with their zealotry. Uh, they act in the name of Islam, they use Islamic concepts, so I'm not gonna say they have nothing to do with Islam, but they represent a very fanatical strain in the Muslim world today. They typically call themselves jihadists, you know, the term jihad is out there, uh, I should just emphasize that Islam does have a notion of jihad, which means struggle, but it, it has meant uh, traditionally military struggle in the name of God. So there is something there. But in traditional Islamic understanding, doctrine, jihad never meant attacking innocent civilians. It was jet war between armies. Muslims fought with crusader armies. It was battles. Actually, there are injunctions in classical Islamic jurisprudential texts saying that do not attack women and children. Prophet Muhammad has saying, fight in the name of God, but do not attack women, children, monks, and do not uh, tear down trees. S these, this fanatic strain started in 30, 40 years ago, saying that we have to attack civilians because we can defeat those big armies. So they adopted modern terrorism methods and they called this jihad. But overwhelming majority of mainstream scholars condemn this, so we should, I think, uh, mention that. So groups like ISIS, Al-Qaeda, these are really extreme, although they're very dangerous. But I'm of the opinion that even in mainstream Islam today, there are serious problems. Not terrorism problems, but authoritarianism problems. And I will focus on that a little bit. That's mostly my work is about. Uh, what, what is this problem? Well, that is an, a lack of appreciation of full human dignity and liberty. Uh, if you go around the Muslim world today, there are like, some, there are like 47 Muslim-majority countries. Uh, you will find a big lack of freedom in, 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 in broad sense in most of them. Sometimes that problem comes from not Islam, but from secular ideologies. Uh, one of the worst Muslim dictatorships is Turkmenistan, and you know the problem there is not Islam, but it's, it's communist heritage and the cult of personality that's still continuing there with Stalinist roots. Uh, you have problems with nationalism. You have secular dictatorships as well, but there is a an authoritarian understanding of Islam, which is in practice in at least a dozen Muslim countries: Saudi Arabia, Iran, Sudan, uh, and the problem there is an understanding of Sharia, Islamic law, that uh, doesn't allow apostasy, and, and it executes people for apostasy, which is to changing your religion. Of course, if you change your religion from Christianity to Islam, that is welcome. <laughs> but if you change from Islam to another religion, or if you become an uh, atheist person, if you declare that, that's considered apostasy, and that is criminalized. Uh, and uh, bla there are blasphemy laws which can put innocent people in jail. That has happened in Pakistan recently to Asya Bibi, a Christian woman. Uh, there, are, there are laws that consider non-Muslims as unequal and consider them in a lower status. There are laws that don't accept gender equality, you know, degrade women. So there is a problem today in mainstream interpretations of Islamic law that is Sharia, which is out there. We have to accept that. Uh, but why, the, why do we have this problem? Where does it exactly come from? And how can we go forward? I'll try to say a few things about that. Let's begin with Islam, I mean Islam itself. What kind of a religion is Islam? Uh, if you read the Quran, if you look at Prophet Muhammad's life, you will see a very basic theme. Islam was a proclamation of monotheism in a pagan polytheistic Arabia. In seventh century Arabia, we Muslims believe Prophet Muhammad was just an ordinary man, he was not divine, 
He just received the divine message to proclaim monotheism to a pagan society. Mecca was a place of a pantheon. People worshiped hundreds of gods. And Prophet Muhammad came and said, there's no god but one god. And who was that one god? The Quran makes, leaves no doubt about it. It's the god of Abraham. So it's the same god who had revealed the Torah before, who had sent Adam and Moses and, and Noah before, and Jesus as well. The Quran acknowledges Jesus highly as the Messiah, accepts the virgin birth, but, but doesn't define Jesus as divine. So there's a the big difference there between Islam and Christianity, but highly respects Jesus and Mary as well. Uh, so in the Islamic understanding, Prophet Muhammad was just yet another monotheistic Abrahamic prophet to Arabs, this, uh, people who didn't have the monotheistic tradition of Jews and Christians. Uh, and on this, again, I think it's fair to, when we're criticizing Islam in a comparative perspective, always I think it's fair to criticize, uh, compare it to Judaism rather than Christianity. Because on most issues, Islam followed the Judaic pattern. Why do I say that? Well, the Quran is a book like the Old Testament, at least the first five books, in terms of its content. Uh, Prophet Muhammad is a figure like Moses. Actually, Moses is the most significant person in the whole Quran. The most, his, his stories are all over the Quran. Uh, maybe a combination of Moses and Joshua, because he led also wars to protect his community. Uh, a lot of Muslims think that they are defensive wars. Some of them have interpreted them as aggressive wars, and that therefore they justified conquest, but that's a disputed issue in Islam. Uh, and most importantly, just like Judaism, Islam emerged as a legal religion, which means there is a divine law, a very detailed law that you have to observe, and that law defines your piety. In Judaism, it's called halakha, and Islam called it sharia. They're very similar, actually, on many issues. Dietary laws, you know, Jews don't eat pork, we don't eat pork. You know, boys are circumcised, same thing in Islam. Uh, or other, and, and the, the only difference, though, the big difference is, though, in Judaism, uh, Halakha was a law that ruled the land until the Romans came and destroyed you know, Judea in the uh, first war century. So after that, Jews have been a stateless minority for 2,000 years. So the penal code of Halakha didn't get implemented after that. So there has, no be, there has not been any stoning in the name of Judaism for 2,000 years. One of the last episodes you see in the Gospels, you know, Jesus Christ and, you know, says, let, let who, has the, who doesn't have the sin uh, cast the first stone. So it was there, obviously. But after that, Jews became minorities, and they started to learn as minorities, and they were persecuted as minorities for a great deal of uh, history. Uh, and today, modern-day Israel is more of a secular state, so you don't have a halakhic state there. But in Islam, the Sharia became the law of the land, of states, of empires, in an unbroken way. Uh, so therefore, uh, these are both legal religions, but Islam in Islam, the Sharia also became the basis of a political system that we, in the Middle Ages, you know, call the Islamic Empire and their legal uh, system. And, and, and it had a caliphate which ruled Muslims. It had lo uh, laws about how Muslims will live and worship. It had laws about non-Muslims and how they will be governed. Now, I should say that for its time, this Sharia-based medieval system wasn't bad. Uh, it was a time that most people converted each other forcibly. Whereas, for example, in Islam, according to the Sharia, Jews and Christians were given the right to remain as Jews and Christians. And that was a big blessing at that time. That is actually why there have been there has been cases of Jewish exodus from Christian Europe to the Islamic lands, to the Ottoman Empire in particular, because the Ottomans didn't force Jews to convert, where, whereas they were they were going through that experience in Spain, for example, in, in the 15th century. Uh, the Sharia gave Muslim women the right to own property, which was, again, not a very common thing in that era. So for its time, it was not bad. And actually, nobody criticized uh, human rights violations in Islamic law five centuries ago. However, things dramatically changed 
uh, in the world in the past three, four centuries. Uh, with thinkers like John Locke, ideas of freedom, ideas of equality before law, they came around and they were established. Uh, Christianity sometimes spearheaded these new ideas, sometimes made its peace with them. So in the modern world today, we've come to a position of human rights declarations. All people are equal under the law. They have a right to change their religion, to be religious or not to be religious. So there's a whole new set of ideas about human rights. Now, Islam is struggling to whether accept these ideas or not because they conflict with what we have as the traditional Islamic system established under the Sharia. And there are Muslims who think that everything is written in the medieval text should be implemented as such because they're legalists. They think that you know, what is written is there without question should be implemented. And there are Muslims that are more flexible. And there's a whole spectrum out there about all this. I should remind that as a, if we're speaking about history, the Ottoman Empire, uh, which was based in Istanbul, my hometown, you know, uh, actually did some interesting reforms in the 19th century, which can give us some hope for the future. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was the seat of the caliphate, the leadership of Islam. So, and what we call today the Middle East was much, much of it was the Ottoman Empire. In the 19th century, the Ottomans realized that there are new ideas in the West, things like constitution, you know, equal citizenship, uh, freedom of religion, and should we accept these or not? They struggle with these things. And ultimately, they did important reforms to accept these modern norms and institutions. The Ottoman Empire, for example, uh, turned the ban on apostasy obsolete in the middle of the 19th century. They accepted a new penal code, which didn't have any corporal punishments, which didn't have a punishment on apostasy. There was a punishment on blasphemy, but it was jail sentence for just three weeks to two months. And now. It, was, it wasn't a huge, deal. sorry, three weeks to two years at maximum. Uh, again, today, we, I'm not advocating blasphemy laws, but it was better than being executed, you know, as they do in Pakistan today. Uh, the Ottoman Empire declared Jews and Christians equal citizens of the empire and convened an Ottoman parliament in 1876. Uh, well, the parliament was abolished two years later by Sultan Abdul Hamid, and he thought, you know, these ideas are nonsense and we don't need this Western thing called democracy, but then it came back. So it's important that these reforms were taken by the Ottoman Empire under the Sunni Caliphate. And at that time, of course, there were reactions. There were conservatives, reactionaries. The most fierce reaction came from uh, people called Wahhabis. There was a small sect in the middle of Arabia that many people didn't know because they represented the most rigid, literalist interpretation of Sunni Islam. The Ottomans suppressed them a few times by sending them armies. And people thought that they would die out as because they're so marginal and fanatic. Well, in the 20th century, uh, those people realized that they're sitting on top of the world's biggest oil reserves and uh, they became a powerful state and actually they started to use all that wealth to promote their interpretation of Islam, which is most rigid to all corners of the Muslim world. So that's a new problem we had in the 20th century. Plus, in the 20th century, after the col uh, collapse of Ottoman Empire, colonialism came to the scene, European colonialism. That made many Mus Muslims reactionary to Western ideas. The West became an enemy to resist and fight. Uh, ideas of liberalism were trashed out, and more collectivist ideas came to the scene, Arab socialism, Arab nationalism, and ultimately Islamism as a reactionary force to bring back medieval interpretations of Sharia as much as possible, you know, and to impose them in Muslim society. So these battles are going on in, in Muslim societies today. Uh, one, one way of dealing with this problem is to, well, render religious law irrelevant. To say, we have, we have secular law, religious laws are out there, I mean, we don't, we're not implementing them anymore. That's the case, actually, in many Muslim-majority societies today. In Turkey, there's a secular law since the beginning of the Republic. Muslim societies in Bosnia, Albania, they're secular. So nobody, not all Muslims are living under Sharia. Uh, not all of them want it, you know. Uh, however, th once you have a religious law out there which says certain things, some people will have the passion to implement that. And they will try to do it with uh, coming to power with democratic means or sometimes authoritarian means, sometimes violent means, which gives us this whole picture of troubling conflicts today in the uh, Muslim world. Therefore, I believe in looking at them through the religious law and 
thinking how we can reinterpret it today and how we can make it compatible with the idea of human rights that we have today. Uh, it's an evolution of thought that has happened in, I think, in other religious traditions as well. I think the Catholic Church, if I'm not wrong, you know, in the 1960s with the Nostra Aetate has taken certain steps forward t towards like accepting religious freedom and so on and so forth. Uh, my colleague and friend Daniel Philpot, uh, who's, who has a book on Islam and religious freedom, just newly published, he, he shows that how uh, doctrine evolved within Catholicism and th the same thing can, th can, can happen in Islam. Of course, in Islam, we don't have a pope or a central authority who say this is the right doctrine, so it's a much more chaotic and, and uh, decentralized effort. But yes, how can we go forward on these issues? Well, one thing is to, say, to understand that the Sharia, many Muslims think when you say Sharia, it's God-given. But actually, Sharia is just an ideal. It's, you implement it as jurisprudence, which is called fiqh in Islam. And that is mostly man-made. A little bit of it is it rooted in the Quran, but after the Quran, there comes the sayings of Prophet Muhammad, which are disputed because those sayings were collected after a long time after he died, uh, more than a century after he died. And then there are the interpretations of these by medieval scholars who lived at a different time and, and, and who had their own cultural backgrounds and so on and so forth. So let's just make understand that the Sharia is mostly man-made and it is not fully divine. Uh, moreover, if you just go back to the Quran, actually there are strong bases for freedom. If an important verse in the Quran that all the you know, liberal-minded Muslims love to quote uh, is la ikraha fid din in Arabic, which means there is no compulsion in religion. I quoted that in Malaysia before they arrested me, and you know, that was one of the problems they had with me in quoting that verse because they interpreted it differently. Uh, to the, another verse in the Quran says, uh, the truth is from your Lord, let anyone who want to believe it, let anyone who want to disbelieve it. So there are verses in the Quran like this. They were typically verses declared when Prophet Muhammad was the head of a minority in Mecca when he was persecuted by the pagans. So Muslims were asking for religious freedom in Mecca. Prophet Muhammad then had to flee Medina and in Medina, Medina was still threatened by Mecca, so there were wars between Mecca and Medina in the ne next phase of his career. Uh, and that's where all the jihad you know, discussions come from. Uh, now, you can understand these wars saying that, well, he was a minority, he, defended, he couldn't survive there, they had to defend themselves. So that, those wars were just contextual and a special uh, case. However, mainstream Islamic tradition understood it in a different way. They said, those wars and the aggressive verses there about war override the ones about toleration and, and peace that were there in the beginning. They brought this uh, theory called abrogation. They said the wars is about fighting the unbelievers, abrogate the verses about not, not, no compulsion on religion. But that is a human interpretation. That's not in the Quran itself. So now that is something we have to challenge. We are challenging, and you know, they're challenging back, but you know, that discussion is going on today among Muslims. Is abrogation real or not? Uh, some people who challenge abrogation pay this with their lives, and, you know, in, in, in some, uh, like in Sudan, and it's, it's a sensitive issue, but this is one of the discussions. The other discussion is the context of the Quran. Uh, the Quran doesn't have many of the things that are in the Sharia today, and they are bothering. Like, the Quran has no apostasy ban. The Quran has no blasphemy laws. So the Muslims who say, let's go back to the Quran are actually solving a lot of the problems that we are discussing today. But there are some things in the Quran that would not go, that would not be compatible with our modern sensibilities of human rights. Like what? Well, corporal punishments. Uh, probably you are aware of corporal punishments because they happen, you know, people are flogged in Saudi Arabia, they're beheaded. Actually, 37 people were beheaded in Saudi Arabia just a few days ago with ridiculous charges, generally. Uh, they call their creating uh, turbulence in the land, which is basically being critical of the monarchy, and they get rid of people for that. Uh, there, are, uh, there are stoning laws, not always implemented, but they're out there. Actually, Brunei recently implemented a new penal code which has these corporal punishments. For, for, for Muslims who defend these corporal punishments, the reasoning is clear. God said this, so we will implement it as it is exactly written. But there is a more contextual way of looking into what God commanded. 
And it is this. Yes, the Quran says uh, the hands of thieves should be amputated. Why? Well, one, re one answer is that because there were no prisons in 7th century Arabia. Uh, Islam came to a society which didn't have states and correctional facilities and guardians and like people were not imprisoned. I mean, there were no prisons. You couldn't have brick walls and wait outside and feed somebody inside there for the next 10 years. I mean, that, you would be more advantageous than the guy who's prison inside. You know, he would have shade and you know, food. Uh, in that society, all punishments were corporal. Pre-Islamic pre Arabs also used corporal punishments. Most actually pre-modern societies used corporal punishments because it was an easy, cheap thing to do. I mean, there's, to imprison somebody demands a lot of you know, resources. Uh, you can just flog somebody and let them go. So, that's, so, so the contextual way of looking at these injunctions is to say, well, God had an intention, which is punishing of a crime, which is theft, but that intention was put into context based, based on that context. And that, that intent was put into an injunction based on the context. So today, we can take the idea. The idea is crime should be punished, but we can do it in different ways. And well, the Ottomans already did these in the 19th century. They got rid of corporal punishment. So there are Muslims who are thinking in these terms, but there are Muslims who are thinking in more uh, uh, legalistic and uh, literalist terms. Here, but once you start getting into these discussions, you enter into uh, trying to probe the intentions of God. Uh, and not all Muslims are theologically open to think about that because there's, an understand there's a theological school in medieval Islam which said uh, we can't understand the intentions of God. God, we have to just obey without asking how. Another approach said, well, there are objective values of right and wrong, and God must have acted according to these objective values of right and wrong. So we can understand while guys, God is commending this, oh, is actually he's meaning to do this and that. So there's a more, there's a theological side of this debate as well. And, and that is the topic of my next book. Hopefully we'll be able to speak about that here as well at some point. Uh, behind jurisprudence, there's a theology too. And, and, and whether we believe God's injunctions, orders, has a rationale that we can rationally understand, or whether we have to obey them without asking how, that's an also important rift here in, in Islam today. Uh, now, does economic liberty somehow relate to these issues? I think that's an important uh, topic to discuss. Uh, because Acton has a lot of works on economic liberty, and I think it's a very important aspect of liberty for sure. Uh, I will say economic liberty is going to help Muslims to discuss these issues because it will soften political stances. But by itself, it's not going to solve the problems of religious freedom or freedom of conscience and other issues. Uh, so therefore, I'm very much in favor of spreading uh, economic liberty capitalism in the Muslim world. I have a slogan I borrowed from the left. I say, they say like make love, not war. I say make capitalism, not war. So with Muslim societies do business, that helps, that softens the attitudes, opens up minds, but still there will be theological issues to discuss. So economic liberty is a part of this discussion, but it's not gonna solve the whole problem. There are theological issues to deal with as well. Now finally, um, I have friends ask me typically like, okay, these are interesting issues that Muslims are dealing with. We as non-Muslims, what can we do? How we can solve your problems, right? Well, I say, sorry, you can't solve it, right? It's like our own problem. So it's, it's an intra-Islamic issue. However, non-Muslims, especially Westerners, can help or not help these discussions in Islam. Uh, they can help, I think, in a few ways. Uh, and they can, okay, they can help or unhelp. Let's, let's explain it a little bit. Throughout the past two centuries in Islam, there has been movements for reform, for progress, for toleration, and steps were taken, like late Ottoman Empire. There's a liberal age in the Arab thought, as Albert Hurani wrote about in late 19th century. 
this liberal trends generally came down or were marginalized when there were conflicts between Western powers and, and Muslim societies. Like after World War I, colonialism actually killed the constitutional liberal developments. And instead, you know, because societies, when they feel threatened, they, became, they become a bit more reactionary. That happens everywhere in the world. So therefore, Westerners are not going to help the problems in Islam by occupying countries and launching wars and so on and so forth. That militancy doesn't help. It actually has been one of the problems that added to this. What will help will be peaceful interactions, dialogue, conversations, students' exchanges. Uh, what will help will be to establish a bridge between Islam and the West, Islam and Christianity. And that's why I very much appreciate our effort here today, our Acton bringing Muslim students around the world, uh, scholars to Acton University. I really appreciate those things are the things that we need. Also, I think uh, Westerners can help by preserving a good example of liberty that we Muslims can refer to. Because whenever I like speak to Muslim audiences and I say, listen, there's something called free society and it's really good. We should be like that. Well, I'm not going to point to North Korea as an example. I point to the US or Canada or UK or uh, most of the Western societies. The one answer I typically sometimes get, one objection is that, Oh, is that the liberty that is banning the headscarves are Muslim sisters? I'm saying, no, 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 not that one. You know, that happens in France, not in US, you know, because you know, French secularism is not very good when it comes to religious freedom. Uh, it is important to keep the Western idea of freedom real so that we can refer to it, saying that, yes, this is good. This is good for Muslims as well. Muslims are flourishing in the West as well. You don't need a theocracy. You don't need an Islamic state. You need a free state under which you can be fully Muslim and proud and safe and confident. So we should preserve that good example. And that good example can be challenged by voices on the left or secular progressives who don't want to, who have an understanding of secularism that is really not tolerant to religion. It can be challenged by some voices on the far right who says, we don't want Muslims. Let's expel all Muslims and ban all mosques. And well, if you do that, then I can't say, let's be like the US. You know, We should preserve freedom the, it, with a high bar in the West. So I think other Muslim societies and other societies in the world can look and get some ideas. That's why I very much appreciate uh, the efforts of Acton you know, to preserve liberty in the West, in, in America and Western societies, and show it is compatible with religion. It is not in conflict with religion. That has made me really admire Acton uh, the first time I came 10 years ago. Uh, and you know, I've been c keeping coming since then and I still keep admiring it and, and uh, thank you for having me here. Thanks. We have time for Q and A. So if you have a question, please raise your hand and Andrew or I will bring a microphone to you. Excuse me, thank you for your most excellent talk. Um, I spent a year in Saudi Arabia working along um, the people of Riyadh um, back in the 80s. And um, I, in my impression um, was that there, they were not um, so much open to just human um, conversation with people from the West. Um, and I, I was just curious, uh, since it's you know a, a very Islamic state there, how can we have discourse and productive conversation um, in areas like that? And my other question is, um, what do you feel is the ultimate goal of the radical Islamists, mm -hmm. ultimately? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, sorry to hear that about, I mean, Saudi Arabia. That is not the most ideal Muslim society to, you know, try to engage with. Unfortunately, it's probably the most conservative. And, of course, in Saudi Arabia, there are a lot of people with uh, charitable approaches. And, uh, but, but it's a very deeply conservative society. And I think one block could be, well, it could be just cultural, but religiously speaking, a very negative view of the infidels, 
people outside of our faith is there in, in traditional uh, in some un traditional understandings of Islam. There are other understandings of Islam that are more open, you know. We've, we are all monotheists, we're all Abrahamic, there's that approach as well. But in particular, in the Wahhabi approach, uh, actually they wouldn't be very friendly to Shiites as well. Uh, so it's just anybody outside of our sphere, our narrow sphere, is by definition some dark person, you know, within. Uh, and unfortunately it's there, but it's, it's, it's something that we have to argue against. And there are grounds to argue against that in the Quran itself. Uh, there are verses in the Quran that emphasize the commonality between uh, monotheists, Jews and Christians. One verse in the Quran says, among all people you will find nearest to believers, believers being Muslims, the Christians. Be because, because it says they are not arrogant and they have learned, uh, uh, traditional learned scholars. Uh, there was a lot of sympathy for Christianity in the beginning in Islam. Because when Prophet Muhammad was persecuted, he sent his followers, some of them, to flee from persecution to Ethiopia, where there was a Christian king. And the Christian king welcomed them. And they lived safely in Ethiopia for a long time. They returned back towards the end of Prophet Muhammad's career. So there are, like, there are examples like that. Uh, but other people are thinking, you know, anybody who's not like us is a bad person, so I should have never talked to those persons. So, unfortunately, I'm, ser I'm sorry. Come to Istanbul, I, I promise, better food, and <laughs> politics are a little bit poisonous, but still, I think people might be nicer. Uh, and the other question was, sorry, this... Uh, oh, the ultimate goal of radicals. Oh, they want to dominate the world. <laughs> I mean, uh, like any utopian uh, zealot, like the Khmer Rouge or communist uh, militants. I mean, some of them, well, some of them in their mind are taking the revenge of attacks on Muslims, uh, the revenge of something that happened 100 years ago, or the revenge of something happened in Pakistan, and, but you have nothing to do, but that person has nothing to do, but taking revenge of something that they did, and they being a whole civilization. And of course, that zealotry, we saw that in Christchurch, when a white racist, white nationalist racist, attack uh, a mosque, killed more than 50 Muslim worshipers there. He was taking revenge off things like the Ottoman conquest of Serbia in 13th century, to people who are worshiping in a mosque in Christchurch who had nothing to do with that. But for him, it was them, and he was taking the right. So there is a little bit of that, plus their ultimate utopia. ISIS, in particular, believes in some uh, end-of-life apocalypse scenarios. Uh, they, they believe that we are heading towards the end of times, the Antichrist will come, uh, and, well, the Antichrist defined in Muslim terms, of course, and uh, so they were on the good side, and they, there, there are prophecies about the big battle with the Romans, they took the Romans as NATO and Western armies. So they have these kind of very uh, apocalyptic beliefs. That's in, in ISIS case. And, and Al-Qaeda, for example, what they wanted to do was a clash of civilizations. <laughs> they wanted to provoke it. I mean, in, this is written in Al-Qaeda texts. I mean, in, they said, we will hit the head of the serpent, meaning US, and they will hit back so Muslims will be awakened. They will be all awakened and become like Al-Qaeda in their mind. So they were provoking a US backlash on Muslims so that all Muslims become uh, you know, militants like them and then we fight the ultimate battle and the ultimate battle will be always won by us because God is on our side. It just goes on like that. So uh, of course, again, this is an extreme view. A lot of Muslims were actually hated Al-Qaeda because they brought this onto us, right? Uh, and, and the same thing for ISIS. But yeah, you have a view like that in there. It's uh, apocalyptic, destructive, and a clash of civilizations. Yeah. Thank you uh, for your talk. I was uh, surprised to learn not so awfully long ago there are communities in America that um, practice uh, Sharia law. What are your thoughts about those who would advocate for such a thing, uh, incompatibility? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, I don't know any community in the US who advocates Sharia law as a law of, for the United States. Uh, here's the thing, Sharia is a complicated concept and 
in a certain level, it is totally fine. Like, I observe the Sharia when I go to a morning restaurant. If there's pork, I avoid the pork, I eat the cereal. <laughs> so that's my Sharia observance. Because to me, Sharia is my personal obedience to God. Because just like Halakha in Judaism, Sharia is about what you eat, how do you pray, you turn towards Mecca, that is Sharia too. But also, Sharia is the family law, also it is the penal code, but not everybody understands it in that way. A lot of Muslims agree that, well, whatever your country in, you should observe its laws, but you should follow the Sharia in your communal life, in the way you marry, you divorce, uh, in the way you lead your prayers, and you know, so on and so forth. For example, there are Sharia courts in Britain and they're not stoning people or doing anything like that. That is about marriage and inheritance and divorce. It's family law. Most Arab societies, too, in Egypt, too, Sharia is there just as family law. And I have some problems with the patriarchal interpretations there. Men get more inheritance than women, so we should. Re we, there are some issues there. But it is not something to be worried about the broad society. Now, are there Muslims who want to bring Sharia to the whole United States? Uh, probably some. In, in the UK, there was a group called Sharia for UK. So they were saying, we will ban beer and everything. And they were going to abolish all the statues in Trafalgar Square because that is idol worshiping. And, but this was like a few hundred people. And the overwhelming majority of British Muslims said that these are crazy troublemakers. So these are the people who would identify with ISIS and so on and so forth. They don't recognize any other law other than Sharia. Whereas for many other Muslims, well, the law of the la uh, land is uh, the law under which you can live. And they will not going to condemn Sharia because for them it's sacred, but they will not want to bring it. So I think we need a more nuance on the discussion of this very term. And I understand. I mean, uh, people in, uh, in, the, in the Christian world, Western world, are... They see all these horrible things, stonings, killings. They don't want that, of course, happening. They, that should not happen. That should not be allowed. But if Sharia just means people uh, like Orthodox Jews have a way of life and maybe an arbitration court on issues like marriage and inheritance, that itself should not be seen as a problem, I guess. hope this answers. Thank you. Uh, you make a very... Uh, convincing case for a, a moderate, a, a more moderate uh, view of, of Islam. I uh, want you to speak to, to this question. After 9-11 and other similar, although less dramatic events, why was it so rare for moderate Muslims, particularly in the U.S., to even speak out against that radical portion of Islam? If, if moderate Islam is is the norm, and that's the exception. Why did so few moderate Islam leaders speak out against uh, activities like 9-11? Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Well, actually, many Muslims spoke against and condemned it, but maybe they didn't find big voice in the media. I mean, I, every Muslim leader I know in the US condemned 9-11, and they said, uh, this is not jihad, you know, this is murder of innocents. They could, they could have done more, and I would like to see more indeed. I agree with you on one part that I would like to see more protests against all these groups. But here I think there are a few reasons behind why we don't see it more. First of all, a lot of Muslims refuse to be associated with these people in the first place. They have, why are we being associated with these people? They have nothing to do with Islam in their mind. In their mind, Islam is peaceful and jihad doesn't mean killing innocent civilians. So these groups are beyond the pale. They even refuse to somehow be hold, be you know, being held responsible for that. Another approach, which is common in the Middle East, which you might find bizarre, but it is there. Um, a lot of Muslims believe that these are CIA conspiracies or Mossad conspiracies or things like that. Because they can't associate this with Islam. It's something terrible. It's put stain on Islam. So Muslims couldn't be doing this. So somebody else must be doing this. So that they are doing this to create pretext for wars and so on. That's a very commonly held belief in a lot of Muslim societies. So that is wrong. That is, a, I think, a misunderstanding of reality. Uh, they should understand that this is coming from within our ranks, and we should oppose that. But at least it shows that they are not condone. I mean, they are not uh, accepting it. They are not uh, seeing it as something legitimate. Uh, on the other hand, I think regarding terrorism, there are a lot of condemnations. But I think I would like to see more 
condemnations or more reasoned answers to issues like apostasy laws or blasphemy laws. In Pakistan, for example, Asya Bibi was in jail for so many years, more than six years, uh, based on a false accusation of blasphemy. And some, some Muslims spoke out. One of them was killed for being speaking out on this. Uh, so some, might be, some people might be also not speaking out because they don't want to get into trouble. I mean, speaking out on these issues might bring you uh, wrath from these groups. So that might be the other case. So to sum up, I mean, I think a lot of Muslims do speak out. Uh, and if it's not enough, maybe these factors are out there. I also think that uh, the Muslims who speak out really don't, in, in this way, I mean, against her, they are not sometimes that attractive to the media. And when I was writing my book, Islam Without Extremes, 2011, I was looking for a publisher. And one thing in 2009, uh, the publisher told me that, well, these modern Islam books are not doing well. We, we need books like Islam is terrible sort of books. They, they sell better. I mean, because that shocks and, you know. And, and I know, for example, sometimes radical people are making the news because they're saying shocking things. And, and people see that. Other people are saying this is wrong, but you don't make a headline with that. So there's just this dynamic of media which is putting into our face the most uh, appalling things, but not the maybe nicer uh, scene. Uh, so that's what I can say on that. Thank you for that very thought-provoking talk. Uh, my question is in regards to your last point, the how can we help or not help, and in regards to uh, as Western influence is withdrawn from both Egypt and Iraq, we've seen Arab Spring and ISIS. How would you explain that in your context of that? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, as Western influence is pulled out of Egypt, uh, that led to the Arab Spring, right? And then pulled out Egypt of Egypt or Iraq, you mean? Uh, Egypt, originally. Yeah. Okay. Like, with Qaddafi. Oh, um, Libya. Libya. Um, okay. My apologies. Sure. My apologies. Uh, and then to ISIS and Iraq and Syria. How does, how does that explain uh, a liberal move in this context? Sure, well, uh, first of all, U.S. is not responsible for everything that's happening in the Middle East. U.S. involvement can help or not help, and I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not advocating either a militant U.S. foreign policy for sure. I'm not advocating a totally hands-off uh, policy towards the whole world as well. I've seen U.S. military interventions have been helpful in places like Bosnia and uh, Kosovo, where, for example, Serbian aggression against Muslims there were averted. Uh, but I can certainly say that occupying countries is generally not a good idea. Uh, Iraq, in Iraq, the occupation of Iraq, uh, I mean, Saddam Hussein was a terrible dictator, but once he collapsed, I was with an Iraqi the other day, he said, now we have so many Saddams, at least we had one before. So these are rival tribalistic societies, deep, deep cleavages, cleavages that are deepened by the conflict itself. And then uh, you pull out, the state has collapsed, people run for power, and then you have a chaos. I mean, let's not forget that US occupied Iraq and the fruit was ISIS. I mean, ISIS came out, ISIS came out from Iraq first, then it spilled into Syria. So I think US power in the world should try to First, with diplomacy uh, and soft power, try to solve the problems in the world by making deals and using alliances. Uh, there might be cases of genocidal cases that you might militarily intervene to save a population. Uh, I, I do see the wisdom behind that. Uh, I mean, in Libya, Libya was a, I mean, in Libya, Gaddafi was toppled and Libya devolved into a civil war. The thing is, when you have a civil war situation, there will be a lot of good guys fighting for freedom, but then, whoa, ISIS will see an opportunity there and they will have a franchise there, which is what happened in Libya. So uh, certainly a militaristic approach is not gonna help, but I think US power should be there for encouraging moderation and diplomacy and uh, encouraging and criticizing its own allies for human rights violations as well, I think. One mistake of US governments, I think, in throughout the past half century has been to support dictators that are US, pro-US. Those dictators torture some people in their jails. Those people in the torture people hate not just the dictator, but the US as well. And that is the root of some of the militancy we have seen in the past couple of decades. 
I would say so. I mean, U.S. should support the principles of freedom in the U.S. and in the world as well. And that means sometimes criticizing that even some allies. So in much of the case Christianity, um, some of the things Jesus taught kind of supersede some of the Jewish stoning and, and that yeah. sort of thing. In the Quran, does later supersede earlier as a, as a general rule or, or not so much? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I should say you had a great start in Christianity. Like You had a great start with a uh, wise person like Jesus of Nazareth who criticized religious bigotry and literalism and appealed for the heart and conscience and, and who didn't leave behind a state but who left behind just a small faith community. And it was a faith community for three centuries. Then came Rome and it became state religion and problems began to emerge in Christianity. You know. Uh, in Islam, that happened in the very beginning. I mean, Islam became mixed with the state in the second phase of Prophet Muhammad's life and with caliphs and empires, it went on like that. So now our mission is to redefine Islam as not a state religion, but a civil religion. And it has already happened, you know, through history and different circumstances, but there are people who are resisting to keep it as a state, like a state-imposed religion, a religion that comes with power, whereas a religion that is outside of power is, I think, the, the ideal. Uh, in Islam, uh, there is nothing like Old Testament and New Testament. There's just one testament, the Quran. However, there are different cases in the Quran. I mean, there are the, there is a, there's a word which says, go and fight the unbelievers and kill them. It says that. But when you read it, oh, these are the unbelievers who actually persecuted Muslims in Mecca, and Muslims had to flee, so they attacked again. So there is a warlike situation. So does that war verse, uh, verse about war, does that define a universal obligation to fight, or does it define a story that happened there? Like, I mean, when you read the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, if you read it, it's pretty harsh. Uh, does the commandments there mean Jews and Christians should go out there and you know, implement those verses about killing the Amalek? Uh, no, it's history. A lot of Muslims read it like that today, Others think, no, it's valid. Those people are here. We should fight. So they, they could like that. So it's not a new Old Testament thing, but within the same scripture, which has different parts, which one you think as more definitive and more universal? And uh, there, is a tendency, there is a tendency to take the warlike verses as more universal, but that happened because early Muslim empires wanted to expand because that's what expires want. <laughs> so that's what empires want. So... So seeing that political element in early Islam and detaching it from religion itself is one of the arguments uh, that the liberal reformists are making today in Islam, including my humble self. Yeah. Hi, thank you. This has been very thank interesting. You. As a Christian, I do look at the Quran because I want to learn more about other religions. But I'm wondering if the taqiyya is still current um, today, because it's if people don't know what taqiyya is, it permits Muslims to lie. And as a Christian, we're supposed to love our brothers and sisters and not lie to them. Um, it has different verses, such as establishes that there are circumstances that can compel a Muslim to tell a lie. This verse tells Muslims not to take those outside the faith as friends unless it is to guard themselves against danger, meaning that there are times when a Muslim may appear friendly to non-Muslims, even though they should not feel friendly. So mm -hmm. how do you feel about that? Thank you for asking that uh, topic as well, ma'am. And well, taqiyya is not in the Quran as a concept. Taqiyya is like being discreet about your faith, hiding your true beliefs and, and things. It is mostly... Uh, in the Shiite tradition, not in Sunni tradition. And there's a good reason for that. Shiites were minorities. I mean, fr from the beginning, Shiites in Islam have been minorities. They've been persecuted at times. So they, they, they told to themselves, don't say your true opinion about Aisha or Omar, you know, the people that Sunnis like, but the Shia don't like. So you have to be discreet about those things so the Sunnis may not persecute you. Now, this doesn't mean that a Muslim, every Muslim believes that they should lie all the time about their ideas and so on and so forth. Uh, people lie, I mean, sometimes for strategic reasons, I think that happens in every tradition, but I don't see a general encouragement for that in the whole Islamic tradition. Uh, that verse 
uh, there's no takia in the Quran, but the words you mentioned that don't take, Jews and Christians not, don't take them as friends is there. But the term friend, evliya, used in the words, is actually like a alliance, a military alliance, and like trusting them in that sense. There's another verse which says, God commands you not to take friends, only those who have fought you in the first place. So there were, when the Quran is speaking of Christians and Jews, it's not speaking of Christians and Jews in Grand Rapids or California. It's speaking of Christians and Jews that happened to be in Mecca and Medina at the time. And there was a tribe, Jewish tribes, that made alliance with Muslims. Then they shifted alliance, so there was a war on them. These are nasty issues, so I'm not saying that good things happened there. But it is those people in that particular circumstances. The, the mistake of the mainstream Islamic tradition has been to sometimes generalize those contextual verses to a broad vision. Like that whole idea of not, not, non-Muslims being unequal, being dhimmis, you know, that they are not. That comes from a verse in the Quran. It says, fight them until they accept the paid jizya, which is the text, which is an extra poll text, and they accept the supremacy of Islam. Now, this was taken as a general universal rule that Muslims will conquer places, they will allow Christians and Jews to live, but they will tolerate them, but they will see them as uh, inferior. There are now Muslim scholars saying that, no, that verse was about a particular you know, group that Muslims fought at the time it was like any war reparation deal. I mean, you fought us, you attacked us. I mean, uh, you pay some war reparations and you accept our now uh, supremacy over you. So how do we understand these things is a complicated issue. And one mistake I think is done by sometimes militant Muslims and sometimes critics of Islam is to say, oh, you see, there's a verse in the Quran which says, go and kill the believers. Well, if I go to the Old Testament with the same approach, I'll tell you, I'll find a lot of parts that are not sounding very nice. But they ha th that had a context, that had a history. And uh, Christians can say, of course, it's the Old Testament. For Jews, it's the only testament. So how Jews understand today is, I think, very important. Well, overwhelming majority of Jews do not understand it as you know, uh, commandments to go and kill, attack, or those things. Some of them did. There is, there are, there is a radical strain in the Jewish settler movement in Israel. One of them, Baruch Goldstein, attacked the mosque and killed Muslim worshippers in 1994. He said, I'm fighting Amalek, the biblical enemy of Muslims. Other Jews, thank God, they said, this is insane. These people are not Amalek. That was a historical episode. We have just more of those people in the Muslim world today, the people like Baruch Goldstein. But uh, we're trying to deal with them. Yeah. Thank you. That concludes today's lecture. Thanks, Mustafa. Thank you.